Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics. These amazing blue fabrics are called Social Butterfly by Bannertex. And as you can see, we just kept making project after project after project. So before I dive into the pillow covers, which we'll be going through today, this is Quilt As You Go Project by June Taylor. The other projects on the set with me today, this is Easy As ABC 123 kit. This is a pattern I designed years ago and we just keep remaking it in new fabrics and it looks fresh and different every time. And I love this collection. Blue has never been my favorite color, but I think it's kind of becoming one of my favorites, especially with this collection. This is called the Tory Tote. This is another June Taylor project. We have video on that as well. But today we'll be going over the Quilt As You Go pillow covers. And as you can see, there's three different styles. Of course, we did them all in Social Butterfly. So I'll just be going over one of those with you today. But really the techniques are the same from pillow to pillow. Of course, there's certain differences. Uh, maybe there's just something unique about the way that that one constructs. But the idea of the sew and flip is the same. So when you get your batting kit, of course, You'll have your batting and it's pre-printed with numbers. This is really sew by number. And that's really fun because I remember doing paint by number when I was a kid. So this is familiar to me. Um, they've numbered those pieces so that you know that piece number one goes down first, followed by piece two, piece three, and so on and so forth. One of the things that June Taylor asks you to do, which does not feel natural, is when you unfold your batting is to not press it. I am just naturally, when I get a piece of fabric, if it has a fold in it, I iron it away. So don't be tempted to do that. We don't want to shrink or distort the batting. It needs to stay in this form. And as you work it through, it will just naturally kind of release those folds and wrinkles and smooth out. So the first step in their instructions are to go ahead and cut out a half inch beyond the drawn line. It's not, don't worry if it's not exactly half an inch. You just don't want to cut exactly on the drawn line of that specific pillow batting. So definitely leave some margin behind. And you'll be using a, a piece of muslin. Now we have these, all of these projects of, as kits, of course. But if you'll be buying the batting and doing it maybe with your own fabrics from home, just an inexpensive piece of muslin. This isn't the back of the pillow. It's the piece that's behind the front of the pillow. Because again, these are pillow forms that have an envelope backing. So that piece of muslin is actually behind the very front uh, of each of these pillows. And as you can see, the heart is a really important piece that we want to accentuate. So in your kit, we're giving you a bigger piece. I want to show you what that looks like. And you'll want to really kind of figure out uh, how you want to fussy cut that so that you're maximizing getting the heart motif exactly where you want it, especially on this one right here, where you want to have that heart just so. Rather than just randomly cutting a square, you're going to be able to get exactly what you want. Now, each of these pillows, of course, features this fabric. So rather than just kind of grabbing the middle of your fabric, you might want to take into account where you want the heart to occur on the other pillows as well, and kind of strategize that before you start cutting. The other fabrics are really not fussy cut. We just kind of cut wherever it landed on that fabric. But this one in particular, we did want to make a point of getting a perfect heart. So knowing that I know how to do the other pillows and I've looked at those measurements, I know that if I cut this heart right out here, I'm still going to have enough fabric left over to fussy cut the other hearts for the other pillows. But again, depending on the piece of fabric in your kit, you want to lay that out and make sure you have that calculated for each of those before you just start cutting. Now for this particular uh, pillow, that this is the one I'll be making with you today, it's a six and a half inch square that's per piece one. I have the six and a half inch, I love this ruler, and the actual name of it, let's see, what are they actually calling this one? They're calling it a six and a half inch square up and fussy cut. Now, beyond this project, there's a lot of quilt blocks that are six and a half inches, of course, unfinished going into a project. This is a fabulous ruler to have on hand for squaring up that size block. So think of the ruler beyond this project, but for this project, it's ideal. And of course, that particular block 
Notice it's, let me bring it back over so you can see that from the overhead camera. It's on point, so it's, it's got that beautiful diamond shape. So we are not going to have our ruler like this, which was your first instinct, but rather on point. And notice how this beautiful vertical line and horizontal line really help you line up. I just love that part of Creative Grids rulers. So I, I'm going to line up. Now, if you're trying to visualize, where's my actual finished six inches, right? Six and a half raw, six inches finished. That solid line running around the outside of that, everything inside of that will be seen. That is that quarter inch seam allowance. So when you're trying to visualize that, if you're inside that outermost black solid line, that will be visible. If that is descending underneath that and extending, that will be not visible. So that might help you to maximize this ruler to get the effect you're looking for. So I'm just gonna, I'm kind of running my particular ruler from that point of the heart into that kind of saddle of the heart. And I'm going to go ahead and cut. Now I know I'm not going to use this side piece out here, so if you want to go ahead and do that, you, you know, just cut off the edge, that's fine. So now I'm just going to draw that toward me, so it's a little bit more of a natural angle. I don't cut underneath my arm. I, I see people do cuts like this, and I don't do that. Um, that's why sometimes using a spinning mat on something like this is helpful, but because of the size of the project, I didn't bring the spinning mat today. There just wasn't enough room. All right, and we'll cut here, and again, right here. Saving the rest of our fabric for our other two pillows. Okay, well, let's put that aside. So that's number piece number one. Of course, our pattern is telling us what size to cut those other fabrics, and we've done that ahead of time. Let's put that tool aside, and let's get our batting out. Now, one of the things that June Taylor does recommend is if you are wanting that lining fabric to be adhered to the, to the batting, you might use a basting spray. Be sure to do that in a well-ventilated area, maybe even outside, um, because it can be fumy. And then these will be literally tacked together. I find that batting historically has a clinginess to it. Um, and because we are in a closed space, I don't have the basting spray and I'm not using the basting spray. And so you're seeing me where this is not attached to it. But again, if you are more comfortable, you don't want anything shifting around, go ahead and use that basting spray um, on the back of the batting and then adhere that to the lining. All right, piece number one is going to go down. And then piece two is here, and piece three. Let's grab those. And that's this dark blue. And you can see that that's going to fit beautifully right there. So that line between them, we'll just put our fabric right side together. I'm going to put in a pin. Don't want anything to move. And I'm going to pin the other side too, so I make that my trip to the sewing machine efficient. Okay. You'll be using a standard quarter inch seam allowance. Now you might want to consider, especially if you're going to use the basting spray, using a size 80 needle, the super non-stick needle, because you are going to be going through a, uh, a sticky, potentially sticky um, spray. So, you know, whether you're using heat and bond light with fusible applique, or you're using a fusing spray, as in this case, the super non-stick, it, that's its job, is to just kind of glide through that fusible product and just keep, keep going without getting clogged up 
or creating any kind of um, problem with your thread. So we'll be using a standard quarter and seam allowance, and I'm just going to sew from here to here and here to here. So let's get started. Okay, we'll just rotate over here and go do this one real quick. Okay, now I know if you're a quilter, you're like me, and I'm reaching for the iron, right? I'm used to sew a seam, press a seam. But in this case, again, June Taylor says, please don't iron the batting. Please don't iron the batting. So we're not going to iron the batting. But I need that crease. How am I going to do that? This clover uh, rolling tool is amazing. This roll and press is so fantastic. And you can see that, I mean, I just sewed this with you. It's not like I pre-pressed anything. It truly does a fantastic job. So if you love the June Taylor projects, and we have a lot of them sh at Shabby Fabrics, we love them, just get the roll and press because really all of her patterns are the same way. All right, so that's perfectly pressed out and ready to go. Now, as you would expect, we go back to the pattern. What's the next cut? And I generally recommend you go ahead and just cut all your fabrics at the same time. So we would, you'd have that ready to go. But I always like to test it. Is that going to fit in the box? Yes, that's perfect. And now we go right sides together again, and right sides together again. Again, we sew and flip, we sew and flip. Same thing with the corners. Let me show you the corners real quick. I wanted to show with, while it's more open and you can see. Notice how this is what it's going to look like, just like that. Notice how their lines extend beyond the boundary line, and that's for you to line up so that you can see where you're going to line this up. And as you know, triangles need to extend beyond that line so that by the time there's the quarter inch seam allowance sewn, when they're flipped, they now meet that. So when you're lining up those corners, which is so much easier for me to show that without this piece on. You just, I just make sure I have an equidistant amount of overlap over my outer line on both sides. And I'm at least meeting that dash, that line that's extending. That's how you'll kind of get that ready to go. And then you very carefully flip that over and pin in place. And you can see how we're extending evenly that amount past the line and that amount past the line. And then you'll sew and flip again. So I'll do all of that offline. When I come back, those will be sewn down. And now we'll move on to what's next and we'll get our pillow all put together. So I have the pillow pieced with the four corners on. And this is when you could maybe do top quilting if you want to do that. This would be the perfect time to do it. Um, I'm not going to quilt at this point. I'm just going to go ahead and go forward. And June Taylor now gives us permission to go ahead and press everything out. So that pressing that we've been wanting to do, we can now go ahead and do that. I've pressed it. And I just, of course, make sure that I'm still pressing into those corners. If any of your fabric doesn't extend exactly into those four corners, don't worry about it. Like I can see that line a little bit, no problem. One of the other things that June Taylor does, which is really appreciated, is those blue lines that are the boundaries of our pillow, they extend those into the batting up above, down below, and to the side so that we can see where to cut. Now make sure your lining fabric doesn't have a tuck underneath it. Make sure it's all nice and flat. And I'll be using my two and a half by 24 and a half inch creative grid ruler. And I'm lining up that blue line and this blue line. And we will trim this up. 
And we'll just do this on all four sides. Again, I can see that line up there. That line here. And we're done with our roll and press. I'll turn, put that away. These are so fun. These are a standard 16 inch pillow form, by the way. So you don't have to make the actual pillow if you don't want to. Now, of course you could make a simple little pillow and that finishes at 16 inches and stuff that if you want to. But the 16 inch pillow form is readily available on the market and so you don't have to, to make those. And what I love about the fact that they um, have the envelope backing is you don't have to keep rebuying pillow forms. You only have to buy them once and you could be making these um, same pillows in other fabrics, which I love that. Okay, so we're all squared up and ready to go. Now the next step that is in the pattern is they want you to go ahead and secure this edge to our batting and to our lining fabric. And so you could go ahead and sew as much as a quarter of an inch if you want. It could be an eighth of an inch. We will be taking a, a half inch for our binding, which is unusual. That's what makes this have this nice, strong, profound edge. So if you're more comfortable sewing a quarter inch to sew, secure that, go ahead and do that because we'll be covering that up with our half inch seam allowance. So let's go stitch that down right now. Okay, fantastic. And I like that. I like that I don't have to worry about that edge rolling back. So this is all secured now, and let's put that aside. Our next step is to make the envelope backing. So let me just move some of this, and we'll be using our iron for this step. You'll be wanting to change your thread, and I'll do that shortly here. I'll do that off camera and I'll be changing the thread color to whatever your backing fabric will be. In this case we have this beautiful butterfly fabric. We have two pieces and if you've got your pillow here. Now consequently I want to mention something straight away is the size of the backing that is mentioned in the pattern is a little bit bigger than the pillow forms. Don't worry, we're going to trim that all up. Go ahead and cut your fabric to the exact sizes that they mention. And it's this long edge that will be, um, we will go ahead and fold under using another awesome clover tool. Because trying to fold under, they want you to fold under a full inch and fold again. It's, I, don't, I don't visually sew an inch, so I don't visually usually press an inch. So that's, an, that's a measurement that is a little more obscure to me to be able to, to nail. So I love this hot ruler where I can easily find my one inch, lay this down. Now if I'm over it, I, I need to move my ruler up. Let me move it so you can see that. Let me move this away so you can see. If I fold this over and I still see the one inch, I haven't moved my ruler down enough. So that's what I love about this, is I can get a nice even all the way down ver versus, you know, I think that's an inch and I kind of work my way down. We can roll that over. So once we kind of hit that line, there we go. Let's go ahead and follow up with our ruler. And why they call it the hot ruler is because you can leave that iron on there and it's not melting. Of course, most rulers are plastic, right? So you can't be doing this iron on a plastic ruler. It will ruin the ruler and probably ruin your iron too. So I love that I can just leave my iron on there and not have to worry about damaging anything. This is one of those types of notions in your sewing room that you buy once 
for the rest of your life and you never have to buy it again. And of course, there's lots of other measurements, eighth inch, quarter inch, whatever it is you're trying to achieve, this ruler will be able to do that. I think the maximum I'm here is two and a half inches. So if it's two and a half or less, this is your ruler. Now, once you've got that line established, it's very simple. You simply fold it over once again and iron. all the way down. Now, I would, of course, and I will repeat these steps off camera just to save us some time because I want to definitely be showing you more things about binding and stuff that's coming up. So we'll repeat that with the other piece. Um, and I'm also going to change my thread to be uh, dark blue. Now, this is where you want to go ahead and sew you know, about an eighth of an inch away from the edge of where this uh, makes contact with this part. So that just a straight stitch and I'll have that done. So when I come back we can jump right into how do we put this backing onto the pillow and go to the next step. So my backing pieces are ready to go. Now let me show you the easiest way to do the backing. It's, it may be a little bit different than the pattern but let me show you what that is. I'm going to line up with a line on my mat. I'm going to line up with, say, the 20 inch line here. And I'm going to lay that piece out. And notice how I have the wrong side up. Again, that may be a departure from the pattern, but this seemed to be a little bit of an easier approach for me. So we're going to overlap that just enough that we are measuring over 17 and a half inches. That is mentioned in the pattern, so that's not a change or a, a preference. That is measured in or uh, mentioned in the pattern. So I have this overlapped by a couple inches so that I basically have a 17 and a half inch square footprint here. Now I know they mentioned in the pattern that you could go ahead and pin these pieces together. I'm going to pin the whole thing together shortly, so I'm not going to pin at this stage. Instead, I'll take my pillow front, and I'm just going to position that where I can see a little bit of that backing fabric on all four corners, so that when I do kind of square this up and trim this up, I'm trimming a little bit away from all four sides. Now is when I'm going to go ahead and pin everything together. So that's why I don't feel it's necessary to, to maybe pin that backing. I also don't want pins against the bottom of my sewing machine that could potentially scratch my machine, um, or I could inadvertently run over a pin and break a needle or maybe damage my machine. So I like to keep the pins up on the surface with myself and just pin extra, because we certainly don't want that backing to roll back and get a tuck in it. So pin, pin, pin. Let me just pin a lot more. Okay, I think we're pinned well here. And I'm just going to sew that quarter inch line again. Okay, we're going to unpin this. Now, as you can see, the backing is a little bit bigger than the pillow front. And although I don't believe that mentions in the pattern, naturally you're going to want to go ahead and trim once again along that same visual line that you trimmed from before. So I'll trim that up. And I'm just going right along that same line. And I like to kind of line up with my mat. That's just me. I really like things to be well aligned. It's a chance for me to kind of square up my project.
Now the binding is what is next, and it's the final step. These, as you can see, go together really quickly. For your binding, you're cutting two three and a half inch strips, and those can be by width of fabric. No need to do a bias cut, so I'll put that aside for now. And I'll grab those two strips. So the first thing I like to do when I'm joining binding strips, that the new the new tool that is my absolute favorite is that corner clipper. You know, I used to, when I would join binding strips, I'll show you the old fashioned way, or maybe that's the way you currently do it, is first, the first thing I would do is, is kind of just clean off those raw edges, right? So let's just do that. We have to do that anyway. So let's just do that. Those are all clean. And I should actually make sure they're, they're square. I did that a little bit quick. Let's, let's do that again. Let's make an appropriate cut. So the way that, that I always did uh, joint binding strips is I'd go 90 degrees like this. You, there's nothing wrong with doing this, by the way. This is tried and true. I've done this this way for a very long time. Any straight edge. I'm going corner to corner. This is a corner clipper, by the way. <laughs> which is, it's ironic I grabbed that, because that's the tool I'm going to use instead of this technique. But um, any straight edge, drawing a line here, pinning, sewing directly on the line, sew and flip, check my line, and then go. It's a little bit cumbersome. It's not my favorite way to do it. Now, your binding strips, they need to be either all straight up or all straight down, but not a mix and match. All straight up is what I'll do today. Make sure you've got a nice clean edge over on this side. And I, what I love about the corner clipper, you're going to see here momentarily why I love it, is I'm lining up in this corner, thus the corner clipper. I'm going to line up in that corner. Now I'm going to cut. And what this does for me is when I go to line these up, look how they just fit like a puzzle piece. There is no mystery. There's no drawing the line anymore. Those days for me are over. <laughs> and I'm very happy for that. Sometimes when I would draw my line and, and pin it by the time I moved it to the sewing, thing, uh, sewing machine, my strips had shifted. And when I would open them up, they weren't exactly in line, and I wanted them to be in line. So let's go sew this together with a standard quarter inch seam allowance. Move that pin. Okay, let's check that. Let's see how we did. Oh, left another pin in there. And look how it just makes perfect. It, it's foolproof. It really is, um, does such an amazing job of, it has so many things that the corner clipper does. It's amazing for piecing blocks together, joining binding strips as you saw. Um, I just love that. And go ahead and press the seam open. Here's another thing. There's none of those dog ears left over. Like when I would join binding strips, I always had those points left over and had to, to clip them. Notice how that's just not there. And look how it's just seamless. Okay, as you would do with any binding, we're just going to fold that in half. All right, so my binding is prepared. Now, what makes this unique, uh, this project unique, is that they're using a half inch seam allowance. That's why we have this nice, bold, kind of almost looks like piping, but it's not. So um, we are going to be using half inch seam allowance. Now, if you're a quilter like I am, 
I am very comfortable with a quarter inch seam allowance. The half inch seam allowance is a far more elusive thing. And I don't have a specific, um, any kind of markings on my machine that show me where that is. So if you're in the same boat and you're like, I don't know if I feel comfortable with that. Let me show you a technique. It's just a technique to find the, uh, the half inch seam allowance. Maybe I'm saying a quarter. Half inch is what we're talking about. And marking it on your machine with some temporary marking tape that's not going to leave any residue. We're using painter's tape and a small ruler. Let's jump over to the machine real quick. This is our two and a half by six and a half inch ruler. It's, it's perfect for little things like this. Um, and we have three layers of painter's tape just stacked one on top of the other. So it makes this nice ridge that your fabric will glide along. So you can either try to just guesstimate. If you're using a Bernina, I can see on my throw plate, I have a 5 eighths inch. And the next line over is my 4 eighths. That is my half. So if you're comfortable with that, you don't need to go through these steps. You can just do that 4 eighths half inch seam allowance and kind of visually have your fabric gliding along this line. But maybe you don't have that particular throw plate. Maybe you're sewing on a completely different machine. One idea, us knowing that that's a half inch here. That's a half inch here and a half inch here. And they're both going to be important because initially, I'm going to be putting the painter's tape here, but I'm going to be making a, another mark later, and I'll explain what that's going to be about. But let's get started with... We're going to turn our ruler this way initially. Now, don't get anywhere near your presser, your, your actual foot pedal of your machine. I'm going to try to get my ruler to be square with my machine, and as I lower my needle, that needle should just touch that half inch mark. When I believe I'm, my needle is on that, and I'm perpendicular, kind of squared up with my machine. Let me move that just ever so slightly. When you believe that you've kind of reached that kind of place, and I can see that this ruler is running parallel with the other line, so try to look for other visual cues, because you could be here but have it like this. You can see that, right? So you, you have to look at more than just this. You need to also look at, am I running parallel? And when you believe you are, go ahead and put that painter's tape down. Go ahead and that's going to be your guidance. And if you want it to be more back, that's fine. But the fabric, you want it to track along there. Okay. Now, I mentioned this other half inch. And that's going to be our pivot point. So let's actually, I'm going to move that to about right there. And I'm looking for my next half inch line, which is actually the number one. I'm going to put a mark right here. Because when I'm coming down into my corners and I make a pivot, I need to know where to stop. This will make more sense once you see me start sewing the binding on. All right, let's go ahead. We've marked our machine. We feel we know where that half inch is. We know what this is. This will come into play shortly, but let me grab the pillow. Don't never start a binding in a corner. You never want to do that. And we're going to leave a very long tail initially that's not sewn. Maybe I'll start more about that midpoint. And I'm going to leave a nice long tail here. You'll see why that's important. And you know what I just realized? I need to make my mark out much further because I'm not going to see that line when I start sewing. So let me extend that line. There we go. All the way out so I can see it. Okay. So we're going to leave a very long tail just open. I'm just going to start sewing down here. And I'm going to bring my fabric all the way to the edge of that blue. 
So let's get started. I just visually make sure that that binding is running right along the edge of the pillow. Now when the edge of this pillow meets this line, I will stop, go back, stop, and cut my thread. That's our pivot point. So I'm just kind of keeping an eye on that right there. Right there is the corner I'm looking for. There. So now I'm going to go back a stitch or two, come forward and cut my thread. Now what we'll do is this is the pivot. I turn this 90 degrees. I roll my binding back. See that? It's at a 45 degree angle. So I make, an, it's 45 degrees, and this should be a 90 degree angle. So let me try to get my fingers out of the way so you can see that. So you see how that folds back and you see how that line is just a visual extension of this. It's not out here or out here. You're going to know it's folded back properly when it's just this visual extension of the edge of the pillow. Once you have that, fold it back on top of itself. We're now That's right in the corner, stacked on top of each other. I'm going to go back to my machine. And now I want to start sewing a beam that line. So again, sometimes I just kind of hand crank it down there. And I'm like, am I at that space? If you want to bring the ruler in again to measure that, go ahead and do that. And it looks like I'm right at the right spot. So we start sewing again. And I'm going to go ahead and back stitch a little bit. Those corners get a little more tension going over. So let's go forward. I probably took a couple extra stitches, but I'd rather be sure than have that come apart in the corners. So I'll repeat this in those corners and on the side where I started the binding, I'll catch up with you there and show you how to join those two ends to have just a seamless finish in the binding. Okay, so I've got the binding, uh, I've got the gap, right? You've got the end and the beginning. And actually, as I look at this, the technique I'm going to show you for the binding takes a bigger gap than this. So if that is the case, and uh, 10 inches is probably ideal, at least 10, uh, you'll see why shortly. So if that's the case, I, without even thinking about that, just started sewing that binding strip kind of on the mid, mid side, right? That seems natural. But that's going to be too short for what I'm going to show you real quick. Now, if you have already know your favorite binding technique, you can go ahead and just do that favorite binding technique that you love to do. Um, but if you're looking for a kind of a really cool way, this takes just a little bit of extra effort, but it has a really professional look. It takes a little bit of getting used to, and maybe you already do this technique, but I want a nice long gap. Okay. I'm going to get my pressing mat, have your iron on really, really hot. Now let's lay our binding strip down. Let's get some of those threads I just seam ripped. Let's lay our binding strip down. I'd love to have the binding kind of join like right about there on my pillow because I've got this pulled back almost equidistant. Maybe I'll pull back just a little bit more. So I have my binding kind of equidistant from the two ends. And so it's natural that I'll go ahead and make the binding join about the mid point. So lay that binding strip down and then roll it back on itself and give a really good press. 
Don't be shy about using steam. I need a really crisp edge. You need a really crisp edge because we're going to be visually using that edge. Same with this one. Let's go ahead and lay that down. Now I want to keep a quarter inch gap. Don't lay those so that they're butted right up to each other. You want a quarter inch gap between those two. And again, a good strong press. You'll want to grab a marking tool, a small ruler, and some pins, because that is what is next. All right. Now with the project facing you, if you do it the same orientation every time, this could become simpler for you to, to get used to that sight picture. So with the side that's on the bottom, I'll go ahead and open that. And I want to point out the nice crisp, this crease and this crease and this one here. We need those creases here with this one, we're going to open that. And here, let's just look at the creases real quick. Same, we have those creases. We're simply going to line those up with these creases. Now, if I need to fold the top of the project down, that's fine. Let's just stack those creases on top of those creases. Looks like I need to move down. Up oh, a little bit more, because I'm I'm stacking these, but I'm trying. There we go. Now we're set. All right, lay it out flat. Let's grab our marking tool. It's probably a little bit easier on this side, only because I've got the bulk. And I'm just going corner to corner. I know my arms in the way just a touch. I apologize for that. But you can see what I've done here is marked it like that. Now I'm going to pin, 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 pin. You cannot over pin this. Double check yourself that you're lined up here, here, there, and under here. And I am. I'm going to pin so that when I move this to the sewing machine, nothing budges because these need to be stacked the way that they are for this to work out properly. And here's the good news. If something gets misaligned, you can just seam rip and start again. No big deal. All right, let's just move this to the sewing machine. Oh, let's remove our pins. Don't cut anything yet. It is very easy to get this a little bit cattywampus. So I like, look how nice that is. We, that looks good. So now, once you've confirmed that all is well, now you can take this here. I'll take a um, straight edge, and I'm just going to trim. A little quarter inch seam allowance there. Okay, and that can go in your scrap bin. And let's just, let's just press that. I really love to press that open. Here, there we go. Just have to fuss with it just a little bit. Now you'll just fold those together as you would expect. Look at that. Look how it's just, isn't that such a cool technique? Now you've got your little, little dog ears from just where they joined. That's fine. Just trim that away. I'm going to go finish up that half inch seam allowance. I've removed my tape. I should have left that on there. Keep that on there. You could either reset that or just leave the tape on until the project is done.
And isn't that such a cool binding technique? You know, I've been quilting for, let's just say, a long time. <laughs> and I love learning new techniques because there's really sometimes a better way to do something or maybe a more per polished look because I, I love how when I roll that edge over, I can't even tell where that union was of where those strips came together and really how they finished so seamlessly. So I love to press binding out in a way just that gives it just a little bit more of a finished edge. Not absolutely necessary, but I think it just helps make it just a little bit, again, more polished. You know, you're going to be showcasing these pillows, maybe on a couch, maybe on a bed, maybe you're giving them as a housewarming gift, and you want to, of course, put your best foot forward and make them look as beautiful as you can. Now, this is where I love my Wonder Clips. I use them all the time. So simply roll that to the back. That's where this big, chunky binding comes into play. And just, just a reminder, with the Wonder Clips, they have the arch over the top and the flat side on the bottom. The white side on the bottom is the part that you definitely want to have on the bottom. That way, if you are going to go ahead and stitch this down by machine, that nice flat part just glides beautifully across the um, kind of the plate or the table of your sewing machine. So you can either just turn them over. I think sometimes it's a little easier to clip personally from the back side, and you'll clip all the way around. Let me just show you in the corners. If this is a completely new technique, I wanted to show you what we do in the corners. Is I like to just Again, make kind of that 45 degree angle. I want you to be able to see that. And then I roll that back on top of itself. See how that makes a nice miter corner? And I put a clip in that corner so that's not going anywhere. That, that special miter that we create in the corner isn't going to go anywhere. So you'll clip all the way around. And of course, I clip very close, especially if I'm going to do some uh, mach machine stitching and you will just whip stitch that down to the back um, or if you're going to be machine stitching as a suggestion I'd roll really tightly in, into the back and I'd be stitching into the ditch to try to make sure to catch that backing and that's how you go ahead and finish your pillow you have your beautiful pillow back get that 16 inch pillow form insert that and you have beautiful pillows I know this has been a longer video. Thank you for hanging in there with me. These are a lot of fun. You're going to be seeing a lot more kits and other fabrics coming to you very soon from Shabby Fabrics. So I'll see you next time.